Greetings, fellow aliens. Welcome to the 19th episode of Earthlings 101. This is the first of two videos about time. In this video, we will discuss how Earthlings perceive time, and how they measure it. The second video will not be an Earthlings 101 video but a physics video in the style of No Edge. There we will try to define what time actually is, what gives time its direction, and why we remember the past but not the future. Before we begin, a question for my Earthling viewers. Imagine you are supposed to have a meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now you learn that the meeting has been moved forward one hour. What does that mean? Is the meeting at 9 or at 11? Write your answer in the comments below. This question is more controversial than you might think, and your answer might reveal how you perceive time. What is time? A famous Earthling once said, time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening at once. This silly definition reveals how earthlings think about time, for earthlings, time is first and foremost the order in which things happen. That will have to do for now. In the upcoming second video about time, we will try to give a less redundant definition. Earthlings care a lot about the order in which things happen. Why does this matter? For several reasons. First, it allows adapting to natural cycles, like day and night, high and low tide, summer and winter, etc. We will come back to those cycles later in the video. Secondly, it allows predicting the future, and doing something about it. Suppose an earthling realizes that each time he sees a fox near his henhouse, one of his chickens is missing afterwards. This allows him to establish a causal link between those seemingly unrelated events, and to change the succession of events the next time he sees the fox. And thirdly, communication requires a succession of signals, and the order of signals is important. Earthlings' brains are quite good at learning the order in which things happen. This is implemented in the very rules that determine how the brain wires itself, the so-called synaptic learning rules. Take two interconnected neurons 1 and 2, and assume the first reacts to the phoneme R, and the second to the phoneme E. Now there's a rule called spike timing dependent plasticity or SDDP which says that when neuron 1 receives an input shortly before neuron 2, the synapse from 1 to 2 will be strengthened, and the one from 2 to 1 weakened. So, when the earthling hears the word I, the first and second neurons are stimulated in rapid succession, so the forward synapse is strengthened and the backward one weakened. So the pair of synapses is capable of learning the rapid succession of two phonemes that form the word I. To learn longer words, you need more neurons, but the principle is the same. Other more complex mechanisms are capable of memorizing successions of events that are further apart. This happens in a region in the brain called the hippocampus. It plays a crucial role in memorizing successions of events and recalling them, so-called episodic memories. We will come back to this term later. In episode 12, we learned that earthlings are good at spatial pattern recognition. This is so to say the temporal equivalent, the ability to recognize patterns in time. In other words, the earthling brain is built to learn in which order things are happening. The most obvious patterns in time are arguably astronomical cycles, planetary cycles which cause the succession of day and night, solar cycles which cause seasons, and, to a certain extent, lunar cycles which determine the occurrence of tides in the planetary cycle. This leads us to two important inventions, the calendar and the clock. We will come back to this later. Given the cyclical nature of those astronomical cycles, it is not surprising that some earthling cultures developed the idea that earthling life is cyclic as well. Hindu religion, for example, teaches that earthlings are reincarnated again and again into all kinds of living creatures. Except for, the microbes. <laughs> Hindu reincarnation is very similar to the Algolian belief that the same Algolian is reincarnated again and again through time and space. So they think their whole race is basically one and the same specimen. This belief is the cornerstone of Algolian ethics, how you treat others comes back to you, literally. You might be familiar with Centauri cosmology, which assumes that the universe is some kind of ring baloney which cycles back to the Big Bang. This is almost identical to the beliefs of some Stoics in ancient Greece, who thought that the universe is periodically destroyed in an immense conflagration, and then experiences a rebirth. 
Hindu religion teaches that the whole history of mankind happens in cycles of 4,320,000 years, divided into four ages. This is often visualized as a wheel of time. The Incas, Maya, Hopi, and Babylonians had a similar concept, and so have Buddhists and Jainists. The Jainist wheel of time, for instance, is divided into twelve eras, six of increasing sorrow and six of increasing happiness. For Jainists, time is one of the six eternal substances that make up the universe, alongside space, souls, matter, motion, and rest. I guess earthlings like to conflate the remote past and the remote future, because both are distant eras they know very little about, like faraway lands in the east and in the west. Many languages have even words that can indicate both the distant past and a distant future, like German Einst, Japanese Itsuka, or English once. The Wheel of Time is one example of how earthlings use spatial metaphors for time. This holds even more for the other way they imagine time, linear time. Most Western and Middle Eastern cultures see time as a straight line. But even though earthling scientists understand the concept of space-time, earthlings experience time as separate from space. Don't be misled by the numerous spatial expressions they use to talk about time, those are metaphors. We talked about metaphors in the episode about language. As explained there, earthlings have several levels of abstraction, body, physical world, space, time, society, and abstract concepts. You see that time is more abstract than space, that's why they use spatial, physical and body metaphors to speak and think about time. There are actually two ways to imagine time in a spatial manner. Remember the question I asked at the beginning, about the meeting at 10 which has been moved forward one hour. Some earthlings imagine themselves traveling along a timeline. For them, forward means towards the future, so the meeting is one hour later. Some, however, feel that they are standing still and time is moving towards them. For those, a meeting moved forward is now one hour earlier. And then there are some people like the Aymara or the Malagasy who imagine themselves facing the past, not the future. When they talk about past events, they point forward, for the future, they point behind them. This makes sense because you can see the past but not the future. The Tobacom people in Bolivia combine this with circular time, time moves from behind to in front of the viewer, and then upwards out of sight, where the distant past merges with the distant future. Most people consider time a straight line, in western countries, a line from left to right. In countries where you write from right to left, both directions are in use. In China, time is imagined going downwards. This is also sometimes the case in western countries, especially when talking about family, generations or history. Some earthlings, though, imagine time as a curved path, especially when thinking about their own age. Those lines are called number forms, and they are a form of synesthesia, the experience of mixed-up senses, like associating sounds with colors, or attributing personalities to letters. For earthlings, the present is a slice of space-time as perceived by the conscious mind. But when you examine their brain activity, this slice actually has a thickness. What consciousness perceives as present actually lags behind between a third and half a second. The reason is the fact that the consciousness doesn't receive raw sensory signals, but signals that have already been pre-processed by the unconsciousness. For example, when the earthling sees and hears a noisy event at a distance, the visual and auditory signals arrive at different times but are perceived as simultaneous. On the other hand, when the sound arrives before the visual input, the brain realizes that something is off. There is an interesting experiment to demonstrate both this pre-processing, and the mental link between space and time. Tell an earthling to close their eyes, then touch their arm four times in rapid succession with a robot arm, two times near the wrist and two times near the elbow. The earthling will most likely perceive this as four taps progressing along their forearm, similar to the movement of a small animal. This is called the cutaneous rabbit illusion, which is just a fancy expression for skin bunny trick. Now, let's watch that again in slow motion. The interesting moment is the second touch, it is perceived up the arm, even though the robot arm hasn't moved yet. In other words, it seems to anticipate a sensory input in the future. How can this be? There are two explanations for this phenomenon. The first one is called the Orwellian explanation. It says that the consciousness perceives the touches where they happen, but then it redacts the memory to make it more plausible. The second explanation is called Stalinesque, it claims that the unconscious mind redacts the sensory input before informing the consciousness. It's like a dictator receiving heavily redacted briefs from his subordinates. Personally, I find this hypothesis more believable. There are countless other examples of the consciousness perceiving a somewhat cleaned up version of the sensory input. Think of blinking redacted from the visual input, or background noise removed from acoustic input, or a rapid succession of spoken phonemes perceived as one single sound. 
This preprocessing takes time and needs to combine not quite synchronous inputs. That's why the conscious present lags about a third of a second behind. A similar effect happens with something earthlings are awfully proud of, their famous free will. If you're an earthling, you might not like this, so I suggest you skip ahead to the part where we discuss whether or not the future is real. I'm sure you'll find this a fascinating question. Are they gone? Great. So, between you and me, what earthlings boastfully call free will, is simply their awareness of making a decision, no big deal. Now, you can do the following experiment. Abduct an earthling, put their head into a scanning helmet and then ask them to press one of two buttons whenever they feel like it. Focus your scanner on the motor, frontopolar and parietal cortices. Now, when they decide to press the button, the conscious decision happens within the second before pressing the button. But with your scanner and a bit of practice, you can predict the decision seconds earlier, indications on the decision will show up in the supplementary motor area at about 5 seconds early, and in the frontopolar and parietal cortex up to 10 seconds before pressing the button. That means that you can know what button the earthling will press seconds before the earthling knows it. Don't tell them. In other words, what earthlings perceive as present lags not only behind the actual present but also behind their own decision making, and what they call free will, is merely the feeling they have after their brain has made a decision. One could say that earthlings consciousness is like a show trial where all the evidence has been redacted beforehand, and the decision has already been made. Most earthlings would agree that the present is real, but they disagree whether the past and the future are also real. If you're an alien, you have probably no idea what I'm talking about. Allow me to explain the concept of reality, given that earthlings have a vivid imagination, with stories, dreams, movies and so on, they need a concept to distinguish things they made up from things they experience. This concept is reality, a thing is real if it does not only exist in one's imagination. Now, some earthlings believe that only the present is real, some think past present and future are real, and some believe that past and present are real but the future has yet to be determined. With the discovery of space-time, the idea that the whole of space and time are real has gained some popularity, but many earthlings feel that this is in conflict with the concept of free will. So, are past and future real or not? Most of you aliens will agree with me that this is merely a question of how you define real, but try to explain that to earthlings. But why do you need a concept of past and future, anyway? Some earthlings don't have much use for it. Meet the Pedaha, a hunter-gatherer tribe native to the Amazon. They have a peculiar language which can be spoken, sung, or whistled. It contains no singular and plural, no words for numbers or colors, and no nested sentences or expressions, which annoys the hell out of linguist overlord Noam Chomsky, because it doesn't fit into his concept of universal grammar. But for this video, the most interesting feature of the Pidaha language is that it has only the most rudimentary tenses to speak about the past or the future. What's the reason for this? Well, the world of the Pidaha might be the closest thing to the imaginary land of cocaine, they live in an environment where food is plentiful and available all year long, they don't even have a method for food preservation. Most hunter-gatherers need to plan ahead, follow the migration of prey, store food for the dry season or prepare for a harsh winter. But the Pidaha don't need any of this. They don't talk about the distant future or the distant past, they have no legends, no creation myths they seem to focus primarily on the now. They also have no interest in religion, because they aren't afraid of death, don't think about the afterlife or the origin of sin and couldn't care less about the opinions of holy men who lived thousands of years ago. The Pidaha have no need for time, at least not to the extent other earthlings do. They live mainly in the present moment, give or take a day or two. Usually, earthlings need memories from the past in order to foresee the future and do something about it. There are actually two kinds of memories. When an earthling has memorized how to fish or how to hunt, it's called semantic memory. He knows how a monkey will react when shot at, and knows the signs that indicate the presence of a big fish in the water. In other words, he knows the typical order in which things happen and can use that to his advantage. But that does not mean he memorizes the exact moment he acquired that knowledge. When he remembers the first time his father taught him fishing, when he has an idea of when and where he shot his first monkey, it's an episodic memory. The difference to semantic memory is that there is a timestamp, maybe not an exact date, but an approximative year or age. About 1600 solar cycles ago, an earthling called Augustine of Hippo raised an interesting question, given that earthlings feel they always exist only in the present moment, how can they experience the passage of time? How can they perceive, for example, a song? Why don't they just perceive the current sound? This is possible, Augustine observes, because consciousness is based on memory and anticipation, when the earthling hears a sound, he remembers what came before and anticipates what's coming. 
this allows him to perceive the passage of a song, or of a day, a year, a lifetime, or, more generally, the passage of time. Earthlings couldn't perceive time without episodic memory. As mentioned in episode 14, most earthlings can visualize real or imaginary scenes in their heads. Episodic memory usually takes this form, some kind of head cinema to revisit past experiences. Likewise, most earthlings can imagine a hypothetical situation in the future in their heads. This visualization of past and future scenarios could be called mental time travel. This mechanism is immensely useful for planning for the future, earthlings can relive past experiences and use them to simulate possible future scenarios in their head. After all, the brain's main purpose is not to be nostalgic about the past or to comment on the present, but to predict what might happen in the future and what one can do about it. This capacity can even be used for planning decades ahead, to imagine how it would be to have kids, or to join a monastery, or to fly to Mars. Earthlings are even capable of imagining what might happen long after their deaths, more about this later. For now, let's come back to the day-night cycle, and how earthlings perceive it. Many aliens have a precise internal clock that allows them to feel the exact time in their planetary cycle. Earthlings can't do that, their internal sense of time relies on a very imprecise mechanism, the circadian clock. It's located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is just a fancy expression for little not just above the point where the optical nerves cross. How does this organ work? Well, the circadian clock is imprecise because it is not actually a clock with an oscillator and a counting mechanism, we will define later what that means. It's just a very slow biochemical oscillator. See, the earthling DNA contains a gene called period. In the circadian clock, this DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into a protein, confusingly also called period. That protein's sole purpose is to stop the period DNA from being transcribed to RNA. Once the protein is degraded, the transcription starts again, and so forth. So we have a mechanism that stops itself, starts again, stops itself, starts again, and so on. Guess how long one cycle lasts. This mechanism happens not only in the suprachiasmatic nucleus but all over the body. The job of the suprachiasmatic nucleus is to coordinate those clocks and synchronize them with the planet's day-night cycle. That's why the nucleus sits on the optical nerves, this gives it access to the raw data coming from the eyes, so it knows whether it's day or night. That's why earthlings' sleeping rhythm is easily disturbed by artificial light. Most earthlings switch the lights off before going to sleep. Scientific advice. When you put earthlings in a room without a fixed day-night cycle, they will go to sleep and wake up following their circadian clock. Their cycle is about 10 minutes longer than a full planetary cycle. More generally, the circadian clocks of diurnal animals tend to run slow, whereas the clocks of nocturnal animals tend to run fast. The circadian clock is of course way too imprecise for most timed activities. Earthlings need precise timing mechanisms, whether it's for breathing and heartbeat, for dancing, for playing music, or for dodging animal attacks at the right moment. This timing is not done by one single clock organ but by the choreographic activity of clusters of neurons. This can be simply a chain of neurons firing one after the other, or a complex pattern able to time several activities at once. A great number of neurons are responsible for motor functions, heartbeats, breathing, walking, talking, whatever. All those activities are inherently temporal, so neurons are capable of timing because that's their job. So, asking what neurons in the brain are responsible for timing is a bit like asking which bio nodes in your ship computer are capable of ternary logic, all of them, because that's how they function. Earthlings often use motor patterns for precise timing, tapping one foot when making music, counting silently to 100 when playing hide and seek, or counting seconds by saying 1 Mississippi, 2 Mississippi, 3 Mississippi. Motor patterns can also be used to coordinate timed activities of several earthlings. Interestingly, earthlings sometimes perceive time as slow or fast. Waiting five hours for a delayed flight might seem like an eternity, whereas five hours of visiting a foreign city seem very short. However, when remembering the events later, it can be the other way round, one barely remembers the waiting time at the airport, but the city tour seems like a long and eventful afternoon. Timing events as they happen it's a true timing task. In contrast, retrospective timing is rather an attempt to estimate the past time from the events stored in memory. So, the more events locations and emotions you have stored in your memory bank, the longer the time appears in retrospect. An extreme case of slowed down time experience may happen when earthlings are in mortal danger. This might be some kind of overclocking, a survival mechanism to react faster. 
However, earthlings who make lightning fast yet smart decisions in life threatening situations are usually professionals trained for that exact situation, and in that case, their performance is rather due to trained automatic reactions. I explained this in my video about the guesser and the ponderer. Before we discuss how we aliens perceive time, a word from our sponsor, the Coriolis Saucer Company. Let's have a look at how other alien races experience time. Most aliens see time as a mere dimension of what we call the conglomerate, or spacetime, as Earthlings would say. Some separate the time axis from space, as Earthlings do. But there are other perceptions of time around. The Elgifarians, for example, have no concept of time at all. Elgifar 7 is a tidally locked moonless planet, which means that there is no day-night cycle, no seasons, not even tides. Also, Elgifarians feed on sunlight and aerial plankton found in abundance in their habitat, so they don't need to plan ahead, even less than the Pedaha. They do have a semantic memory, so they know how to gather food, but they don't remember the past and don't have a concept of time. Yet Elgifarians are actually quite intelligent. Their philosophy is intriguing, and their music is famous, an Elgifarian opus is usually just a single highly complex chord. But they live in the moment, even more than the Pedaha. Remember what Augustine wrote, Earthlings perceive the passage of time through memory and anticipation. Elgifarians have neither, so time is as foreign to them as the single non-local particle is to Earthlings. They are unaware of time because they don't need it. On the other hand, we have the Flowlings from Zubanel Genubi 3, who have two spatial axes and, in a way, two temporal axes. These long flexible creatures live in slime rivers, and most of their organs are stretched along the flow direction, quite much like our organs are stretched along the time axis. Information can only flow downstream, not upstream, pretty much like you can't send messages into the past. Also, all kinds of energy turn into heat down the stream, another similarity with the time axis. So the downstream direction behaves pretty much like the future direction, they are experienced as two time axes. That leaves two dimensions for space. For flowlings, time is not a line but a surface. I can't even begin to imagine what that's like. And then there are the Alphil from Chatrang 7 who experience time as a succession of moments. Their planet orbits a pulsar, which hits the planet with radiation every three seconds. The point is that they can only see during these short bursts of light. So they alternate between watching and moving. The wildlife on their planet functions similarly. In consequence, they experience time like a turn-based strategy game, a series of static situations between which they make their moves. For Alphil, Space-time is not a continuum, but a succession of time slices. How do Earthlings measure time? To measure shorter time spans, Earthlings use chronometers. A chronometer is any device that measures time progress in a fairly regular manner. The time is usually indicated with visual and acoustical signals, but sometimes in other ways. This Chinese incense clock, for example, uses different fragrances for different hours. The simplest type of chronometer is the sundial. Just put a stick in the ground and observe the progress of its shadow. In ancient Rome, for example, those devices were ubiquitous, they even had pocket sundials. They usually divided the daytime into 12 equal hours, with the result that hours in summer were longer than in winter. Many Romans hated the temporal order imposed by the public sundials. People in antiquity had other chronometers, independent from the seasons, in particular the water clock, which relied on hydric acid slowly pouring from one container to another. In ancient Greece, this was used to measure time spans, like the speaking time of prosecutors and defendants in a court of law, or the time spent with a prostitute. This illustrates one way earthlings see time, as a limited resource. Earthlings have a relatively short lifespan, and spend at least a third of it sleeping, that's why they consider time a precious asset, something you can spend, save, sell, waste, etc. A Greek inventor named Cebius developed a more elaborate version of the water clock which could be used, to indicate the time of the day. This illustrates the second way earthlings perceive time, as a reference system to specify what should happen when. This is useful for planning and coordination of activities. In the Middle Ages, 
the concept of a water clock evolved into the hourglass, which is based upon the same principle as the basic water clock, but with sand. The planetary circle could now be divided into 24 equal hours, each one containing 60 minutes. But to measure minutes, you need more exact timekeeping devices, clocks. A clock in the larger sense is just a chronometer, but in the narrow sense, it needs five specific components, an oscillator, a counting mechanism, a calculating mechanism, an energy source, and an output. The oscillator is the heart of the clock, it's something that swings rotates or oscillates regularly. The counting mechanism counts the oscillations, and the calculating mechanism transforms those short cycles into longer time units for the output. Finally, the energy source provides energy to the whole mechanism. Usually, the counting mechanism has some part that transfers a little bit of energy back to the oscillator, to keep it oscillating. We find the same five components in Xebius water clock, even if the oscillator doesn't oscillate in a sinus wave, but in a sort of pattern. The defining property of an oscillator is that it oscillates at a constant rate. This definition of oscillator is somewhat circular, to check if it does indeed oscillate at a constant rate, you need to measure it. With another oscillator. But candidates for oscillators you find in nature seem to be fairly synchronized, except for relativistic shenanigans. So that's not a practical problem. A clock can only be as precise as its oscillator. The first mechanical clocks had a pendulum as an oscillator, an escapement as counting mechanism, a weight as an energy source, a gear train as calculating mechanism, and a circular dial with hands as output. Clocks were often quite big and installed in towers in town centers, so the display could be seen from afar. Often, they also had a mechanism to indicate the time with acoustical contractions called bells, so you didn't need to have a line of sight to the tower. Bells were also used to send signals to the whole town, call for religious services, indicate that the city gates were about to be shut, enforce a curfew, or call to arms. Throughout human history, clock towers with loud acoustic signals have been a tool to maintain public order and enforce the power of the authorities. Chinese Bell and Drum Towers A water clock tower in Verona built by Gothic King Theodoric, Japanese water clock towers, belfries all over Europe, clock towers built by Ottoman conquerors, British clock towers all over colonial India, they all proclaimed the same booming message to the population. Maybe you're not interested in time, but time is interested in you. The hands of a clock typically turn like your proximity radar. But why? The usual explanation is that this is the same way the shadow of a horizontally mounted sundial turns on the northern hemisphere. But I'm not buying it, because public clocks are vertical, and on vertical sundials, the shadow turns the other way round. But there might be another explanation, superstition. Most earthlings are right-handed, and it seems that turning right is more natural for them. There is an old English word for counterclockwise, widdishins. It literally means against the way. In Europe, there were a lot of superstitions about left in general and turning widdishins in particular, a woman who dances counterclockwise was believed to be a witch, if you dance around the church counterclockwise, you summon the devil, and so on. So they had the hands of clocks turn clockwise, just to be sure not inadvertently to mount an automatic demon summoning device on a church tower. Superstitions like this are quite common on this planet. That's earthlings for you. Those clocks were quite cumbersome and not made for being moved, so earthlings invented a variant with a balance wheel as oscillator and a spring as energy source. The whole mechanism could be made smaller and didn't depend on gravity. Those clocks were more adapted for voyages. This became especially important when Europeans started to send ships all over the planet, because when you're on an ocean of hydric acid, without any known landmarks, you want to be able to determine your latitude and longitude. Latitude is easy, you just have to measure how high the sun is over the horizon when it's at its highest point in the sky, noon. But to determine your longitude, you need to know what time it is at your home port at that moment. And to determine time at your home port, you need either instant long-range communication, which they didn't have at the time, or a precise clock. So, colonization was a driving force in creating precise clocks that could not only measure hours, but also minutes. But once you have minutes, you can use them to coordinate organized teamwork. A workshop works best when all employees show up at the same time. The same holds for shops, factories, farms, mines, barracks, trains and so on. Also, when you have precise clocks, workers can be paid by the hour, like the Greek prostitutes with their water clocks. Some alien anthropologists consider the clock, not the steam engine, the contraction that kicked off the industrial age. For modern earthlings, their whole life may be timed and scheduled to the minute, not only work but also entertainment, rituals, sports, travel and sleep. 
This depends of course on the region. Japanese culture, for example, values punctuality, and being on time usually means arriving about 10 minutes early. Japanese high-speed trains have an average delay of 20 seconds. In Costa Rica, on the other hand, punctuality is not that important. It's no problem when you show up to an appointment 10 minutes late, or half an hour, or an hour. This is called Tico time. It might be infuriating when you have one friend who thinks like that, but when you have a whole country running on Tico time, it works surprisingly well. On the latest World Happiness Report, Costa Rica ranks in place 23, Japan in place 47. Maybe, time is overrated. Anyway. Modern technology has developed clocks far more precise than the devices used by 18th century explorers. Quartz clocks run on electricity and have a vibrating quartz crystal as an oscillator. But it gets even more precise, atomic clocks. Your flying saucer has probably an atomic clock, based upon a single oscillating lutetium atom. Earthlings don't yet have the technology to do that. Their atomic clocks are basically quartz clocks with an atomic control mechanism, the vibrating quartz controls a flashlight which sends a microwave towards a passing stream of cesium atoms. The atoms get energized and are then deviated by a magnet. Now, cesium is awfully picky about microwaves, if the frequency is just a tiny little bit off, they don't like it, are not energized, and the path changes. This is detected by a sensor which triggers a jolt sent to the crystal, to remind it to stay on track. Those atomic clocks are extremely precise for Earthling standards, so precise, in fact, that they are able to detect relativistic effects. Because, as you all know, time is relative, it slows down on fast-moving vehicles and near-gravity wells. Earthlings figured that out about a hundred years ago, but they still can't wrap their heads around it. As for the direction of time, they have figured out that disorder kind of increases with time, but that's about it. We will talk about all this in the episode What is Time? Since the Middle Ages, clocks have been key to regulating markets and stock trading. Today, atomic clocks are used to synchronize high-frequency trading, performed by algorithms that buy and sell within fractions of seconds. Those operations need to be time-stamped with the precision of a tenth of a millisecond. Strategic Advice Nighttime is the ideal moment for surprise attacks and commando operations. Most Earthlings are asleep four hours after midnight. But don't get the sense of planetary rotation wrong, if you land four hours before midnight, your sneaky attack will happen when earthlings gather for their evening rituals. What about measuring longer time spans? To keep track of planetary, lunar and solar cycles, earthlings have created systems called calendars. A calendar isn't a device, it's a spreadsheet. But what do they need a calendar for? And why does it need to be synchronized with astronomical cycles? If you must, can't you just count days from one to a thousand and call it a year? Well, the first thing you need a calendar for is the seasons. In most regions, the weather changes through a solar cycle, and with the weather changes the availability of food, because plants follow an annual cycle, and animals migrate or hibernate. This is even more important for agriculture, you need to know when to sow and when to harvest, and stockpile food for periods when there is none available. The second reason is rituals. Earthlings communities like to do recurring rituals like sports events, religious rituals, popular festivals and public celebrations, and even personal events like anniversaries. Those are often tied to seasons, or to equinoxes or solstices. Unfortunately, the solar, lunar and planetary cycles are anything but synchronized. So you basically have three options, you stick to the moon, or you forget about the moon and stick to the seasons, or you compromise. When you stick to the moon, you get a lunar calendar, like the Islamic calendar. The time between new moons is called a synodic month, it's about 29 and a half days long. So you more or less alternate between months with 29 days and months with 30 days. The nice thing is that you can see how far in a month you are, just by looking at the moon, you don't need to be able to read a calendar. However, with this system, a 12-month year is a bit short, so what's a summer month now will be a spring month in some years. The second possibility is called a solar calendar, you forget about the moon and stick to the seasons. You divide the year into 365 days, grouped into 12 months, with a leap day every now and then. That's the Gregorian calendar, the closest you can get to a planet-wide standard. With this method, you lose the coordination with moon phases, but you gain a connection between months and seasons. This is useful for knowing when you should sow, harvest, or buy a new sweater. And finally, you can have a lunisolar calendar, a compromise between moon and sun. Stick to lunar cycles, 
but throw in a leap month every now and then in order to synchronize with the seasons. The Chinese calendar works this way. Earthlings often divide months into equal groups of days. The most popular choice is seven days, that's called a week. Why seven? Well, seven days is approximately a quarter of a synodic month. In other words, when you divide the appearance of the moon into four parts, each part lasts about a week. In many languages, the seven days of the week are linked to seven celestial bodies, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, and Sun. The names of the days of the week are usually named after gods that represent those orbs. In Romance languages, we have mostly Roman gods. In Germanic languages we meet some Norse gods, in Indian and Southeast Asian languages we find Hindu deities and so on. Usually, the days from Monday to Friday are reserved for work, societal duties and pursuing long-term happiness, whereas the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, are dedicated to immediate happiness. Strangely, people seem to like Friday rather than Monday, although both days are equally close to the happy weekend. Remember the earthling view that the past is real, but the future is not. It seems to be the other way around when it comes to happiness, some earthlings consider future happiness as real and valuable, but past happiness as lost. Maybe that's because earthlings are driven by emotional markers, as explained in episode 15, they seek out positively marked situations, and avoid negatively marked ones. And you can't seek out situations in the past. In East Asia, days aren't named after deities. However, the Chinese lunisolar years are named after animals, in a 12-year cycle, rat, ox, tiger, rabbit, dragon, snake, horse, goat, monkey, rooster, dog, and pig. We are currently in the year of the dragon. This usually means a spike in birth rates, because dragon babies are considered lucky. Tips for tourists. The Chinese New Year celebrations are a great opportunity to observe local rituals. But stay clear from the sky above the celebrations, your bored computer might interpret the fireworks as an attack, and initiate an emergency landing. Distinguishing years by animals is nice, but not enough for record keeping. Throughout most of history, earthlings called the years after the current ruler, something like in the year 4 of the reign of God Emperor Zog the Magnificent. The second method is to numerate the years, starting with a real or imaginary event in the past, like the foundation of a city. The Hebrew calendar, for example, is a lunisolar calendar which starts one year before the supposed creation of the world, about 5,800 years ago. The most popular calendar today starts with the supposed year of birth of a religious leader called Jesus. Time, as earthlings say, is a great teacher, but unfortunately, it kills all its pupils. However, its pupils are capable of planning beyond their own death. But why would they? Well, remember the genetic imperative, from an evolutionary point of view, the important thing is not self-preservation, but spreading the code. So it makes sense to care about the well-being of your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, of your tribe, your city or your country. A big part of this is the transmission of knowledge, from the recipe for beer to the early warning signs of rising authoritarianism. But how do earthlings transmit information to future generations, so they can benefit from the knowledge of their ancestors? I will give you two examples. Both stories begin at the bottom of the sea. On December 26, 2004, two tectonic plates of the Earth's crust had a disagreement deep under the Indian Ocean, causing the eastern plate to snap. The earthquake caused waves to expand from the epicenter to all sides with the speed of a commercial aircraft. Normal ocean waves are just at the surface, but this kind of wave goes all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. It's called a tsunami. The wave travels underwater, barely visible on the surface, like a giant submerged sea monster. Tsunamis are common in the region, but this one would become one of the biggest in modern history. Once it reaches the shore, it surfaces and becomes a huge killer wave. About 230,000 earthlings would lose their lives this day. Well, I'm going to tell you about two groups that would survive, due to knowledge transmitted from the past. While the wave was approaching, 10-year-old Tilly Smith was enjoying a sunny day at a beach in Thailand with her family. Suddenly, she noticed something odd, the water was covered with a froth, like beer, and the sea was slowly rising. She recognized what she had seen in a video two weeks earlier in geography class, the warning signs of a tsunami, froth on the surface, and the sea either slowly coming in, or slowly receding. She managed to persuade a beach guard to have the beachgoers evacuated to the second floor of a hotel before the killer wave hit the beach. Little Tilly saved about 100 people that day, because she had paid attention at school. This story demonstrates one of the most frequent ways earthlings transmit knowledge through time, 
school education. But how did early earthling societies transmit knowledge, before the invention of educational institutions? That's the story of the second group of tsunami survivors, a small indigenous island community, belonging to the native Mokan people, sometimes called sea gypsies. On that fatal day, a member of the tribe noticed that the sea was receding, and informed the village elder, who alerted the whole village. Get to high ground. The laboon is coming. The laboon was an old Mokan legend, a sea monster sent by the ancestors who gulps the sea in, and then spits it out, to flood the land and purge it from all evil. Legends are mythological stories transmitted from generation to generation. Most legends contain moral advice, explication of natural phenomena, worldly wisdom, spiritual beliefs, or simple entertainment. This particular tale, however, also contained a piece of practical advice, similar to the one little Tilly had learned in school. When the sea recedes, run for the hills. When the wave hit the shore, the village was destroyed, but none of the villagers was killed. Legends like this might be one of the oldest forms of transmitting information orally over generations. This is called oral tradition, and it is, as one earthling savant puts it, the single most dominant communicative technology of their species. Oral tradition includes myths, epics, sagas, folk tales, legends of saints, vedas, folklore, ghost stories, jokes and riddles, urban legends and food recipes. Some of those are conceived in a specific rhythm or follow a melody, not only to make them more entertaining, but also to minimize transmission errors. Some societies have even earthlings who specialize in oral tradition, like the Griots in West Africa, the Irish Shani, the Christian priests, the Chinese Pingshu, or the Celtic bards. Once earthlings invented scripture, they also used books to transmit knowledge, but oral tradition is still alive and well. One could say that oral tradition and books are the memory of a civilization. The importance of transmitting information to future generations cannot be overstated, it's key to building a civilization. But information is not the only thing earthlings transmit to future generations. Other things include traditions, moral systems, nations, religion, art, inventions, games, organizations, and, last but not least, buildings. Some civilizations work for centuries on buildings like temples and cathedrals. Those might seem like pointless projects, until you remember that these buildings are the center of rituals, and that rituals are key to a functioning earthling society. Also, those buildings often represent institutions like churches or nations that span over millennia and give those volatile earthling societies a little bit of stability. And for us alien observers it's a sign that earthlings, despite their awfully short lifespans and notorious quarrels, have managed to look beyond their own antennae and create civilizations able to transmit knowledge, values and culture over thousands of solar cycles. This video is mainly based on the book, Your Brain is a Time Machine, by Dean Buonamano, and, to a lesser extent, on the book, About Time, A History of Civilization in Twelve Clocks, by David Rooney. In the next episode of Earthlings 101, we will talk about the Earthling concept of magic. Spoiler alert, it's not about throwing fireballs and bending the laws of physics. But first, I will make a video What is Time? This will be more about science, like my No Edge videos. So long? Like subscribe, hit the little post rocket, and don't forget to be alien.